So every so often with these kinds of videos, I like to take a driver or a team and just do, uh, well, a retrospective video. And find out if our thoughts on them at the time were justified. Because now we can look at it 20 years later, 30 years later, 15 years later, or whatever it may be, and go, well, actually, they were better than we thought. They were as terrible as we thought at the time, or maybe they were just average, really. As it stands, I've done... Well, I'd say three of these videos. I've done one on Heights Harold Frentzen and his lacklustre performance at Williams in 1997. And Frentzen, as a side note, has become quite the guru on Twitter with his takes on all things F1. I've also done Giancarlo Fisichella and why it seemed like he was always brilliant in mid cars or back of grid cars, but was terrible when he got given a decent one. And most recently, I've done David Coulthard, a decent driver who had to contend with his teammate being Mika Hakkinen while the other guy was Michael Schumacher. So to start today's video, I'm going to take you back to 1990, the year of my birth, as it so happens. And I'm paraphrasing Mark Andrews here because it's just a lovely way to open things up. So picture the scene. You're in a grandstand in Phoenix, Arizona, watching the season opening United States Grand Prix. You're one of about 20,000 people there because putting seats where people could get a good view of the track was an absolute mission and, well, the place was just badly attended anyway. There is a young man racing. He's currently leading. And the guy in second is hoping that the leader has to pit again, but he doesn't, so he goes for the overtaking move. The guy in second was the champion two years prior and is now on a revenge tour for what had happened the previous year. He sends it up the inside into a right-handed 90 degree corner and doesn't bother shutting the door because the outside of the track is dirty and it wouldn't be a good idea to try anything silly. But Assumption just makes an ass of you and me, and the young man immediately lobs his car up the inside of the champion and takes the lead back. A commentator from Birmingham would have likely used the word sensational or something. The crowds loved it, and the media loved it. This young man was Jean Alesi, who was driving an uncompetitive Tyrrell and had decided to pull down the pants of one of the greatest racing drivers that ever lived, who was driving the fastest car on the grid that also had the most powerful engine. This is one way of announcing yourself to the world. Eventually, Senna, who was driving a McLaren, got by and went on to win the race by 8 seconds. But while Senna was F1's ultimate star then, as Schumacher, Hamilton and now Verstappen would be, everyone was looking at this French kid that had gone toe-to-toe -to -toe against Senna with no fear. And Phoenix wasn't a one-off either, because at Monaco that same year he qualified that Tyrrell in third, less than two hundredths of a second slower than Prost Ferrari, and then he'd finished second, just over a second behind Senna after the McLaren developed issues late on. And also in this race, Prost got brain fade and crashed with Berger's McLaren at Mirabeau, which brought out a red flag. And not the first time this would happen at Monaco. You've got Ricardo having his gearbox issues, Hamilton on knackered rubber fending off Verstappen, Senna on knackered rubber holding off Mansell, stuff that at any other Grand Prix would have meant a loss of position. But to be at the pointy end of the grid, making use of a light, agile yet underpowered Tyrrell, this was a driver attracting attention. Now you might be thinking, alright, he's a street circuit merchant with that Tyrrell, but at Monza that year he qualified his Tyrrell in 5th, a second off Senna's pole time, and then in the race overtook Prost who had way more powerful V12, and was then at the backside of Berger, who, like Senna, had the best car on the grid. But he undid all of those heroics with a crash at the second chicane. But like I said, this garnered the attention of other teams, most notably Williams, and Frank Williams, who founded the Williams team, was looking for a brand new driver for 1991 to help bring Williams back up to the top of the championship. So what happened then? Frank had been interested in Alesi for a while, and after his 1990 heroics, Williams decided to get him on board for 1991. A French engine in the car and having a talented French driver who was an up-and-comer seemed a no-brainer. But there was a problem. Frank wanted Senna, but Ayrton was keeping his options at McLaren open while also having the odd chat with Ferrari. Williams said they'd announced their French driver driving their French-powered car at the French Grand Prix. But that came and went. But then at Silverstone, Mansell shocked everybody by saying he was done with Formula 1 at the end of 1990 because Ferrari wasn't going to give him number 1 status. Nelson Piquet told Alesi to tell Frank that he had to announce it as soon as possible, but there was a clause in the contract that said that Frank didn't legally have to do anything until September. With Mansell now being a free agent for 1991, Frank's looking at Nigel and thinking, bloody hell, if I offload Patrese, I can have this Alazy kid and Nigel, or Alazy and Senna. The possibilities. But because Frank was delaying everything primarily to see what Nigel and Ayrton were doing, it kind of got Jean a bit irked, let's say. So he started to talk to Ferrari, and the beginnings of a partnership were starting to be formed. And when Alazy said to Frank, I want to go to Ferrari, Frank said, well... You've got a contract, you're driving for me. So to get Jean out of his Williams contract, Ferrari had to pay Frank $4 million. 
dollars. But it meant that Frank could get Mansell, and now Jean was going to go to Ferrari to team up with his hero, Alain Prost. Now, Ferrari did seem to be a good place to go, all things considered. The technical gremlins surrounding the innovative flappy paddle sequential gearbox seemed to be ironing out, and Prost had been in with a shot of taking the title through 1990, a season that, let's be honest, ended in one of the most unbelievable scenes you'll ever see in motorsport, or any sport for that matter. Prost almost had it. So heading into 1991, Alesi's first Ferrari turned out to be an unreliable bucket of bolts. While he would finish third in Monaco, Germany and Portugal and score points finishes elsewhere at Brazil, France, Hungary and Spain, he retired nine times, with his car conking out while leading at Spa. He would then become the number one driver due to Prost calling the car a truck and being sacked from the team. With a new teammate in Ivan Capelli for 1992, the Ferrari was even worse than it had been before, but he was still able to show those flashes of complete brilliance that made everybody take notice. At Manicor in 1992, Alesi was on slick tyres on a slippery track, but was only a second slower than Mansell who was on wet tyres and in that overpowered Williams. At Barcelona, which was also wet, he'd spun early on, and in the space of two laps he took 14 seconds out of Senna, with Senna later aquaplaning off and Alesi taking third behind Mansell and Schumacher. In Britain, we have a saying. It's one of those catchphrases from television that has sort of made its way into everyday use. A little bit like, uh, is that your final answer from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Homer Simpson's Doe, title of your sex date from Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and other bits and pieces. Uh, what are you talking about, Willis? Uh, Bazinga, but then again, I'm not 12. And that is, have a look at what you could have won. And it has to be said in a thick Lancashire accent. Alesi had gone to Ferrari, which went backwards, while Williams finished second in 1991 with a decent fight for the title, and then won it in 1992 and 1993, and would also go on to win the Constructors in 1994, 1996 and 1997. Alesi had gambled on being able to get 101 or more with six darts, but hadn't done so, missing out on the chance of winning the speedboat. If you've never watched Bullseye, I highly recommend you do. It was brilliant. The only thing that was going to pick things up would be that Jean Todd had arrived at Ferrari after the 24 hours of Le Mans in 1993. With Nigel Stepney also coming in, things were going to pick up a bit into 1994, especially with refueling returning which would greatly benefit Ferrari, because they insisted on still using V12 engines. 1994 would be more competitive, but again it was reliability that was an issue. Ferrari starting to turn into an alpha with all these breakdowns. He almost won it in front of the Tifosi at Monza, but broke down. Berger would win that race instead. But in 1995, he would achieve what he wanted to achieve, something many would argue he'd have had more of already if he'd gone to Williams. At Montreal, Alesi was running second when Schumacher's Benetton started slowing down and had to retire with 10 laps left on the board. Alesi didn't know that he was in the lead for a long time, and when he realised he was leading and on for the win, he started crying in his car, and the tears were causing his visor to fog up. To add to this, he'd won that race on his 31st birthday. At Montreal, at the circuit Gilles Villeneuve, driving a Ferrari with the number 27 on it. He'd retired from the lead another two times that season, but he did almost win the European Grand Prix at the Nürburgring, but Schumacher on fresher rubber managed to overtake him when they were almost in sight of the chequered flag. Once again, Alesi had shown several flashes of brilliance in a car that didn't quite hold up when it needed to. Then at the Hungarian Grand Prix, he found out that he and Berger were being shipped off to Benetton because Schumacher was coming the other way. And just like with Ferrari, Alesi joined Benetton just as form was starting to slip. To add to this, a lot of Benetton personnel were on gardening leave so they could join Schumacher over at Ferrari for 1997, and Rory Byrne wasn't really doing much with the Benetton B196. While Benetton started off decently and Ferrari took a while to get going, the roles were reversed come the end of the season, with Ferrari just taking second in the Constructors' Championship at Japan. Having watched that 1996 season review tape more times than I care to estimate, there was one constant in that season. A lazy being able to get absolutely blinding starts from 5th or 6th to get into the top 2 positions by sort of turn 1, and ended up putting together some decent results, with every race he finished in 1996 being in the points, and destroyed Berger in the process. But Gerhard did have more retirements. At the same time, Flavio Briatore's work ethic didn't quite match up with Jean's, and it created some unnecessary tensions. So after a 1997 season where he would once again beat Berger, a lazy went off to Sauber, and any chance of wins thereafter would evaporate entirely. In 2000, he would join his old mate at Ferrari, Alain Prost, at the, well, Prost team, which I think makes a lazy the only driver to have a guy as a teammate and a boss, and I'm not counting Bruce McLaren, Dan Gurney, Jack Brabham, or any of those 
sort of owner drivers in that sort of statistic if you will but he had a falling out with Prost at some point and then went back to Jordan and I say back to Jordan because he'd driven for Eddie in Formula 3000 but at the end of 2001 that was pretty much career over a lazy to go back to that Mark Andrews piece I paraphrased at the start of the video was a case of wrong place wrong time he wasn't a rubbish driver by any means he showed what he could do in inferior equipment on more than a handful of occasions especially when it was raining. He would fly under the radar as a great wet weather driver versus the likes of Senna and Schumacher who were the rain masters of their time, and the likes of Damon Hill who could also pull things out in the wet. So you might be thinking, he really should have picked Williams then, shouldn't he? And with hindsight you'd probably think, yes, he should. But think back to the Frentzen video I did, if you have actually seen that, I'll put a card up so you can go and watch it later. In that video I explained that Frentzen needed that arm around his shoulder. He needed assuring that everything was okay. He needed that extra bit of help to get the most out of the car that he'd been given. At Williams, well you're not going to get that. At Sauber, yes you probably would and that's why Jean did better at places like Sauber and at Tyrrell where Ken Tyrrell, Peter Sauber were able to sort of give him that nudge and that chilled out environment that he needed to thrive and also being loved by the Tafosi in Italy kind of helped things there even if Ferrari is well Ferrari. Patrick Head and Frank Williams aren't those kinds of people. They wear kid gloves but they're made from real kids. Which is why the likes of Montoya, Hill, Villeneuve, Mansell, Coulthard to an extent, Button I guess and those guys fit in well at Williams while Frentzen didn't. They had that, oh, what's the phrase? Basically, that their personalities matched up a bit with Frank and Patrick. Briatore caused tension with the demands of better performances at Benetton, and that didn't help a lazy either. So in a weird way, he probably was better off going to Ferrari than he was to Williams. Maybe even McLaren, because McLaren were looking at him, and Ron Dennis being Ron Dennis. A lazy might have won the title in that 1992 Williams, given how much faster it was compared to everything else. But it's like having Hill in that 1996 Williams. You have Hill who won the championship, but Schumacher would have probably won every race if that car was tailored to him. He'd have won, but not as convincingly, and that also assumes that the seasons went the way they did in terms of car performance. But this is the thing about Alesi. It seems like he did have the talent, but I don't think he had that killer instinct that so many other champions have had. And yes, there have been gentlemen champions like Jim Clark, Jackie Stewart, Graham Hill, Damon Hill, Jensen Button, Jack Brabham, Mika Hakkinen, those guys. But maybe Alesi was just a little bit too nice and needed that loving arm around him, maybe a little bit of cotton wool, but you need to be a little bit ruthless to be the world champion, even if you are a nice guy and that's why I need to hand things over to you now to have a good old discussion about it in the comments. But the point remains that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time but if he had gone to the right place probably still wouldn't have succeeded. So then I look back at the career of one of the unluckiest drivers to race in Formula 1 and a driver who many feel should have achieved more than he did. If this has taught you something new then do like the video so I know I did a good job and for more like this get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out. Massive thanks as ever to the kind folk at Patreon for the continued support and if you want to help out at a more personal level there is a link in the description to Patreon with channel memberships available if you just want to spam a Roberto Moreno emoji in the comments. Also in the description there's a link to Discord and my socials and a super thanks button if you just want to buy me a coffee. So until next time, I've been Aidan Moord, have a great day wherever you are and goodbye.